啊！The king, king of all the land. Who the fuck that? But how did I come to this? I hear you say. And who are those strange fellows that surround my throne? I hear you also say. Well, it's a long story. Come closer, and I'll tell you. It all started yesterday. And what a day that was! It's what I call. A bad fur day. Chris Seaver grew up playing video games on the ZX Spectrum and the Commodore 64 with his friends, and became a big fan of role-playing games like The Bard's Tale from Interplay in 1985. After getting a master's degree at Falmouth University in 1994, Chris intended to become a 3D artist working in the film industry. By chance, his friend Dave got an interview for a position at Rare and invited him to come along. Chris had never heard of Rare before, and only knew of the video games produced by the Stamper Brothers back when they were operating under their original name, Ultimate Play the Game. When I was at college, I didn't have any money, so I kind of skipped a whole generation of gaming, so I, I kind of missed out on the NES era and a lot of the early PC stuff. And I came back in again on the snares. I sort of missed a lot of what Rare was. In fact, when I got there, I wasn't even sure who they were, <laughs> to be honest. And I did ask, Tim was in the interview, and I said to Tim, because I saw all the Attic Attack and all the posters on the walls, and I was like, Chris, you know, I, no, this isn't Ultimate, is it? And he said, yes, it is. I don't know if he was insulted or anything, but, <laughs> but yeah, I was like, oh, okay. A couple of days after the interview, Chris was offered a job at Rare as an artist, where he soon became friends with Martin Hollis over a game of Mortal Kombat during lunch. It wasn't long before Chris learned about the working relationship between the company founders, Tim and Chris Stamper. Tim and Chris were like, they were tinkering with the NES and stuff. They were one of the first people to ever do it. Chris took one apart and did something with it, rebuilt it, and, and I think Nintendo were really impressed with, with all that. At the time, Chris and Tim, they were young people as well. They were like, you know, they were in, in their early 20s. They were the young guys getting on with their stuff and coming up with new stuff. And, and Chris was a real whiz with, with the hardware. I mean, that's how, that's how that dynamic worked. It was Tim, who was, he was, you know, the big creative driving force for the graphics and for the games. And Chris was the technical guy, the, you know, the business type who would um, make sure that everything was, was on the level. And Tim was there going, right, let's get this done <laughs> and stuff, you know. We're going to do this and this and this. And, and, and they made a good team, definitely. They just had loads and loads of ideas and they developed them and they stopped them and developed this and stopped that. They weren't short of ideas. Rare had recently been hired by Nintendo as a third party developer and given an unlimited budget to produce as many games as they wanted. At the time, there were less than 30 people working at the company, but that didn't stop them from developing multiple games at once. It was Donkey Kong and Killer Instinct and there was the baseball game as well I think was going on at the time. So there was like three teams. There was the main team, which was Donkey Kong, because they just, I think they were about halfway through that. Killer Instinct had just started, and that's why they were hiring people. Nintendo said, oh, here's a load of money, go and hire some people and make these games. So I was one of the ones they hired. Despite each game having a relatively small team size, working at Rare was very different from most video game companies, as the Stamper Brothers had chosen to place each team away from each other into separate barn houses. 
This decision had a lot to do with the geographical location of the company. Well, wherever I was, it was an old farmhouse. So it was literally, in, it was top of a hill. It was in the middle of nowhere, just fields and cow shit. That's it. And um, a tiny little village called Twycross. It's got a pub, doesn't have a shop, and it's, there's nothing there. And there's this premier game developer like slapped in the middle of it. It's like it's very strange. But the barns from the old farmhouse, they were converted into studios, and that's where the barns came from. Within the first month of working at Rare, Chris Seaver was assigned to the Killer Instinct series, where he worked as a background designer. Kev was the character guy. I was brought in to do graphics, as it turned out to be backgrounds, and I did some effects as well. So it was very distinct, it was very sort of, you're doing this and you're doing this. And I did the logo as well, which I was quite pleased about. Mark was the main programmer, Mark Betridge has been there for years. He was doing the gameplay and the engine. Chris Tilson was the design, so he was the Street Fighter guy, the fighting game guy who knew, knew all about that. Simon, motion capture, he, he got in the suit and did all the acting. I guess quite a lot of the moves and stuff came from his performance, so I guess that's pretty important. And then the, the audio words, Robin Beanland and Graham Norgate, who both came in, whose first job that was as well. And so we were all kind of together. They started not long after me, so we all became quite good friends just because we were all the new guys. It was called Brute Force. It was somewhat different to what it became when I, when I first joined. It was like a, a traditional fighter, so it was just gangsters on the street and a boxer, I guess. I guess TJ Combo was the, about the only thing that was really carried over from the original sort of idea. The idea of fantasy characters was, wasn't there, it was very straight. Because it was trying to ape Street Fighter, I guess, because that was seen as the main competition. But we all wanted to pull it in a different direction. It was pretty much down to Kevin, because he would make the characters and he would go, here you go, that's what it is, it's a werewolf. That's it, I'm not fucking changing it now. I used to share a room with Kev, and then I'd just turn around and go, here you go, I'm doing a, yeah, a skeleton. But okay. So what background should I do? Just come up with something, and then off we go. The hardware itself was actually built by Chris Stamper for the arcade machine. Although it was, um, you know, it was billed as being the hardware for the N64, it wasn't really. The idea was to say, look, it looks this good on, on an arcade, it'll look this good in your home. You know, it sort of, sort of did. Chris had to endure a rigorous work schedule, spending long work days within the barn house. But as a young, newly hired designer, he didn't mind it so much given his life situation and work environment. We used to regularly say 12, 15 hours, including weekends. Honestly, it was full on. Ask anyone, ask anyone. It was, that's no exaggeration. We used to do a lot of hours, but it wasn't a problem because it wasn't your normal job, if you know what I mean. It was like an extended family, I guess. It was a different atmosphere. So so being in work, because I didn't, I, I was pretty, I was on my own, I was single. I was just out of college. I was sharing a flat with someone. So being in work was actually more comfortable. I mean, all my friends were in work as well anyway, so. And it was quite a relaxed atmosphere. There was times when you got quite tired, and particularly at crunch. So you were doing overtime, but you were also under a lot of pressure at shows and stuff. But from a graphics point of view, we tended to get our stuff done before everyone else. I imagine software was a lot worse in terms of deadlines and stuff, you know, because they were right up to the very last second of production. The transition between the first Killer Instinct and its sequel was a big leap in terms of technology being utilized, which allowed Killer Instinct 2 to be completed in only about 8 months. The problem with Killer Instinct 1 was rendering, so those backgrounds were actually, it's a sequence of frames, so it's like I think it was 120 frames, and renderers today are fairly, pretty good, pretty quick. But back 20 years ago now, we had, you know, rendering a frame with that much stuff on it, which today isn't that much stuff, but back then it was. You're looking at four or five hours per frame. Then we had this one machine. We got it from Silicon Graphics. It was enormous. And it had its own cooling system and all kinds of stuff, like its own fridge. It was horrendous, <laughs> the noise it made. And we were all fighting for that. So Tim was fighting for it with, with Donkey Kong, and Tim usually won. So I used to have to sneak in in the middle of the night to get my renders done. Whereas in the second one, we had much better machines under our desks. So it, it just meant we could do stuff a lot quicker and, and, and it was a lot more reliable. Technology had moved on, so what I had under my desk, we had things called Onyxes then, which was kind of the same as the big one, but it was still pretty big. I mean, it was like, I don't know, half a meter square, like a cube. They were 150 grand each. We could have those in our room, so I think we had about five or six of those. So it meant we weren't fighting as much. So we could just put more stuff in and get it out a lot quicker, which meant, from my point of view, it was great, because I could change stuff easy. Sometimes with, with, with stuff, you render it out and you go, you know, it would take like three or four days to get the sequence. You'd notice those mistakes and you just go, oh, fuck it. 
I can't be asked. But with the Onyx, you get off. Do you remember that? Do it again. You get more stuff in as well, and it would just look nicer. Uh, plus, I was a lot more experienced as well. And I had a better library of shaders that I'd built up and making stuff from Kev as well. And it was good. Being one of the more dedicated developers for Nintendo, Rare would receive feedback from Nintendo's developers in America and Japan, though Chris and his team didn't receive nearly as much as those working on the Donkey Kong Country series. From my point of view, we didn't, I didn't really see much contact with Nintendo. It was more, Nintendo were interested in Donkey Kong, that was their precious baby in that. Because I wasn't on that team, so I don't really know. And Rare was quite, it was very secretive, even within itself. You know, we weren't allowed in the Donkey Kong barn and, and stuff like that. Yeah, we couldn't go in there. Our keys wouldn't let us in. The few occasions I met people from Nintendo, they were, they were exactly what you'd expect. They were very intense and focused. The language barrier, I suppose, didn't help us. But, but I mean, maybe I came over a couple of times and I, had to, I did actually demo something to him once. And it was kind of like, he was very interested in everything we were doing. I mean, he was definitely like, what, what's this? What's it going to be? How is this going to work? Is this Donkey Kong or not? And, you know, and I know he was involved a fair bit with, with Donkey Kong, but it was, you know, as a general thing. As Nintendo was funding many of their games, they were still constantly surprised by the graphical achievements Rare was capable of putting out on their consoles. It was so new and it was it was, it was so stark. I mean, you look at Donkey Kong Country on, on the SNES, it was it was like a two or three steps above everything else that was out there on the SNES, what you'd come to expect. And I think even though it was their game, I think they were still like, oh my god, this is, I didn't know we could do this. They had trouble with that level of graphics. I mean, you could see it with a lot of the stuff that they were, that they were doing. It was quite simplistic and Rare had this particular style, which was this thing they called the ACM. Uh, let me ask you this, I heard downstairs something about ACM Yeah, that's, that's advanced right? computer modeling. Just a silly acronym, it didn't mean anything. It was just, it was purely down to art direction and people modeling stuff. And I don't think they could do it. I think was the problem because they were definitely used to come over and ask Ray, you know, how how do you do that? How do you do that? How do you do that? What's this? What's this? And they were always involved in that sort of probing us. They used to come over when we first started on the A64 doing the 3D stuff for the first time. They were very they used to be guys taking notes, asking questions, <laughs> going, "What's this? How do you do this texture here?" and sort of thing. And, and they were definitely wanting to know how Ray did it. With Nintendo being one of the company's biggest investors, Rare managed to endure a rough transition occurring in the industry, where companies began prioritizing games featuring 3D polygonal models over the once traditional 2D sprites. From a software point of view, it was like, oh my god. When we did the N64 version of the Killer Instinct arcade machine, not only the backgrounds were 3D, the reason was the time we had to do it wasn't very much, it was like six months. And we had no software to do 3D characters, to do the joints, the animations, if we wanted that, we'd have to sit and write it from scratch. Not me personally, but the software. I mean, it would have been good to do Killer Instinct on the N64 with 3D characters, but it would probably would have taken an extra year to do it. It was it was a big step, and it, you know, you spend an extra year in a game. That's that's quite a lot of money, even if it's only a small team. And everyone was used to sprites. And I was used to sprites. I still like sprites, but. Um, 3D is it's a whole other bunch of work. It's not just a case of having a 3D environment, it's, it's so much else. It's how you make the characters, how you texture them, the joints, the animation, everything's totally different. It's just exponentially more work. That hit a lot of companies at the time. I remember it was good because we had lots of resources. We had Nintendo paying for stuff. We could get all the best people in the industry, which is at the time what, pretty much what we did. As a company, we were taking the cream of the crop, as it were, and you could see the results of that later on. Things like GoldenEye, Perfect Dark, all that sort of stuff, when, when it had a bit longer to get the engines sorted out. But initially, it was a difficult jump. And a lot of the people at the company who were already there, particularly the graphics guys, had only ever done sprites. That's what they were brought up on. That's what they were trained to do. And for some of them, I think, the step to 3D, because I was formally trained in 3D at college. I already had experience and I could kind of pick it up, even with the software that we were given, which was pretty bad. <laughs> Some people were left behind and, and, and I think a lot of companies in general at that time were left behind with the 3D and struggled with it. But eventually, we're, we're at the end. I think we did some good stuff in 3D. When Super Mario 64 was released in 1996, it established many of the foundations for three-dimensional platformers, and companies like Rare used it as a roadmap for how to design many of their future games. They did a lot of fixed cameras, didn't they? Yeah. If you look at their level design on Mario 64, they had bits in the level that they knew that's where the camera's gonna go. Yes. And it was like, yeah. and it was so precise what they did. And anyone played it, unless, because we were looking at it, we were playing it and looking at it, trying to deconstruct the whole thing, weren't we? We yes. were trying to solve how they did stuff. 
by playing the game. Whereas most people who play games don't tend to do that, do they? Only game designers and, and yeah. programmers will look at a game and go, how the fucking hell did they done that? Oh, I see why that's there. Oh, I get you. Structure and stuff like that. When Rare released Diddy Kong Racing in 1997, it was designed as a starting point for new potential leading characters like Banjo the Bear and Conquer the Squirrel. It's, it's no coincidence that Banjo and Conquer were similar games. Mario 64 came out, that was it. It was like, okay, well, stop what you're doing. <laughs> we're doing this now. And everyone just went, well, that's what we're doing. Because it was so radical. It was another big step, genre defining. I mean, it's, you know, everyone does it now, but uh, at the time it was just so, like, holy shit. And it's still a really good, I mean, even today it's, it's an amazing game, the control is still really solid. Very few games now have a 3D character that runs around that's as good as that first Mario game. Nintendo certainly know how to do, uh, how to do movement, that's for sure. While Chris Seaver was busy working on the N64 version of Killer Instinct 2, two different new projects had already begun. One was headed by Greg Mails and called Project Dream, while the other was a 3D platformer which would eventually star Conquer. Allegedly, Conquer wasn't called Conquer, it was just generic 3D platform adventure in the mould of Mario, I guess you could call it, was, was sort of being designed in the background. The idea being that when we were finished with the N64 version, everything would be ready to go with this new platform game and we, you know, two years of graphics or a year and a half and we'd have that out and then we'd get on with another game. But it, it's a bit of a rocky transition. Lots of different reasons, not least Banjo coming along. And you have to understand the sort of politics of the company. Over the years, working in an environment where a game's development team was always kept separated from one another resulted in a growing animosity between teams because they usually never shared design techniques or insight with other barn houses and thus were seen as rivals. So we were in one barn, Donkey Kong was in another barn, and then there was the main farmhouse where another team was and Game Boy. We didn't fucking like each other, did we? As teams, there, there was lots of friendly competition. <laughs> some of it not that friendly. We all fucking hated each other in a nice way. This was always my theory about why Rare Games were so good. It wasn't because we were worried too much about what other people in the industry were doing. We were worried about what the other barns were doing. Yeah. So if we looked over at what Greg's lot were doing and they were doing something really good, like when we first saw Banjo, the graphics, it was like, oh fuck, that looks really good. Bastards. That's how we react. We didn't, we didn't feel good for them. We just went, you fucking bastards. How do we do that? <laughs> we, yeah. we need to do that. So then we upped our game. This was back in the day when you used to write your own. Yeah, so all the yeah. physics yeah. engine, you wrote your own hits. Yeah. There, was no, there was nothing on the internet about hits. Yeah. Damn <laughs> in hits. fact, there was no internet. We had one internet machine at Rare, and you had to book time on it, and nobody bothered to go. There was no, yeah, no internet, no information particularly on the internet if you asked for it. God, can you imagine trying to get reference? If I didn't have the internet now, I'd be fucked for reference. That was pretty much it. There were it was no... a pile of books, wasn't it? Yeah, you had books. <laughs> yeah, books. Uh, and there weren't that many books. We just right. had to make it all up. So all the hits were no, but I, derived I mean, from first yeah, principles. Yeah, reference books. That's why, I reckon that's why most games had jungle levels, because that's the most books we had. <laughs> <laughs> we had the jungle book. That was quite literally it. So all so what level shall we do? We had, we had a snow book. Uh, <laughs> and we had jungle! A, and we had a desert book. Does it? We had a desert book, a jungle book. A snow book. And a snow book. <laughs> and that's it. To serve as a precursor to a planned console game starring Conker, Rare released Conker's Pocket Tales for the Game Boy Color in 1999. It was the first game to feature the squirrel following his introduction in Diddy Kong Racing and had him collecting birthday presents and rescuing his girlfriend, Barry. At the end of the day, there was nothing remarkable about this game other than it was being developed alongside the console version of Conker. This game was first showed off to the public at E3 in 1997, Back then, it was being designed for a family audience, similar to Super Mario 64, and went under the name Conker's Quest. While this game was still in development, Greg Mails and the team working on Project Dream were told by Tim Stamper to visit the Conker studio and see their progress. It wasn't long after this visit that Project Dream would be cancelled, and the team transitioned to work on what would become Banjo-Kazooie, which looked and played very similar to Conker. When Banjo-Kazooie started looking better than what the Conquer team was working on, Nintendo decided to promote it as the next big original game from Rare. I think there was an, it was an official announcement by Nintendo. It was like a, I think it was a press release. Coming soon, new IP. And there was this silhouette. And we saw the silhouette and went, that's, that's Banjo, isn't it? That's not us. There was no mention of us, and I was like, oh. By the time Banjo-Kazooie released in 1998, Conker's Quest had transitioned into what was known as 12 Tales Conker 64. 
The game would take place in a variety of settings with different hats corresponding to each new environment. 12 Tales was designed and built around the concept of an interactive cartoon, so a lot of work went into giving the characters expressive faces. Both Conker and Barry would be playable characters, and they each had a number of unique items to attack enemies or traverse across levels. There were even plans for a cooperative multiplayer mode and split-screen deathmatch. After having worked on it for about 12 to 18 months, development on 12 Tales was eventually pushed aside. As there were already a growing number of 3D platformers on the market, Rare didn't want to have two of their games looking so similar and competing with each other. Eventually, there was friction within the team working on Conquer, and they were put in a position where they had to do something to make their game sufficiently different to justify its existence. It was clear that something had to give with the Conquer team as it was. It was either we just break up or something carries on. And some, so one group goes over here, one group goes over there. And then that left the question of, of what what are we going to do with Conquer? And that's where I kind of came up out of the, the mass of people. And I sort of went, oh, no. <laughs> I've got an idea. Well, the idea was to, to try and pull it in, into some kind of completely new direction and do something completely new with it. Chris rose up from the Conquer team and proposed his own vision for what he wanted the game to become. For every gameplay sequence, he wanted there to be an emphasis on the narrative, which he saw as a way to get more personality out of the characters involved, with a potential for a punchline. Chris wanted to go for the comedy element, but with more of an edge in terms of violence. He supposedly took inspiration from adult-oriented cartoons like South Park and the dark comedy Meet the Feebles by Peter Jackson. Chris wanted to use the name Bad Fur Day in the title, a name he originally suggested during the development of Twelve Tales but got rejected. From the name came the premise for the game, as players would be given a sort of glimpse into a day in the life of Conquer. Some may have called me opportunist, but I, I just wanted to, I thought I've got an idea here. Chris would co-write the game's script with Robin Beanland, but as confident as he was with his proposal, he had to first get the approval of Chris Stamper before going ahead with it. I went to see Chris and said, what do you reckon? And he went, that's a great idea. Off you go. And he sort of, as they do, he went, go on, show me, prove it to me. Don't just tell me. And I went, oh, okay, okay, right. And then Tim and Greg got involved as well initially, and they were kind of quite interested in what we were talking about. <laughs> The Conquer Project had found a new direction to call its own, and the team put in the extra work to make sure their game would be more advanced than anything seen so far on the Nintendo 64. We got the engine and we rejigged it. We did a little bit of work on the graphics to kind of change the visual style slightly. And we added speech, which it didn't have, and that was the thing that kind of lifted it. Banjo didn't have speech. Grant Kirker, he, he was there, uh, you probably won't forgive me for this, but he, he at the time just said, you can't do speech. It's too much, too hard, too much like hard work. And that was a red rag to a ball for us, because we just went, fuck you, now we're going to do speech then. Just to prove Grant wrong. And welcome to Game Grumps. Grant Kirkhope's our very first guest. And as, as uh, we would do so, we were playing his very first game that he composed. I love this game. What do you have to say about it, Grant? Is this some kind of fucking joke? I don't do this game. I, this has nothing to do with me. You dragged me all the way over here from Agora Hills to watch you do this? You fucking wankers. I'm going, fuck you. Shit! When it came time to decide who would provide the voice of Conker, Chris Seaver, having already been familiar with the character and being in the room at the same time, offered to provide the voice himself. It was just convenient. Yeah, I mean, I knew what the character was. It made sense for me to do. Well, we did, we did a few tests, you see. I was there for, oh, what about this, what about this? And this was with Robin. And it just kind of clicked and we went, yeah, that's, I like that. And he did a little bit of tweaking on it with the pitch and stuff and some effects. And eventually he didn't need to do that because I would imitate what it sounded like in the game. So I was putting the pitch on it myself. So in the end, he didn't have to tweak it. I have a modest amount of acting skill, it would seem. Chris provided a majority of the voice work in the game, with animator Louise O'Connor providing voices for the female characters. It was so much work. It was such a ton of work. And it was sort of done in the spare time. It'd be like the end of the day, and I'd be going, OK, Robin, Robin, I've got the next batch to do. Let's just get it out of the way. Because it was such a chore. I find it such a chore. And I always used to lose my voice for a few hours afterwards, particularly with some of the more uh, the louder characters. During development, Rare presented a sample of the game to Nintendo of America's founder, Minoru Arakawa, and Howard Lincoln, to demonstrate its new direction. This sample featured a scene where Conker urinates onto a group of flaming imps. Arakawa found the scene to be hilarious, but Lincoln didn't find it funny at all. Once the team was able to get the game up and running, they had to show it to Tim Stamper before full development could start. 
Tim got a wicked sense of humour, to say the least, and he saw it and, and he, he thought it was very funny. And I think that was it. That was the clincher. I mean, if Tim didn't like it, that would have been it. It doesn't matter what Nintendo said or whoever said, even Chris, it would have been, no. Nah. But Tim liked it. He saw the potential and he said, okay, let's do more of that. I was quite relieved because if I wasn't doing that, I'd be back to doing just support stuff for some other game. Because I don't think the Conquer team wouldn't have survived that. I mean, it wasn't even the Conquer team, it was a team in a barn. At the time, Chris believed the management didn't have high expectations for what kind of game his team could produce, which only drove them harder to prove them wrong. On Conquer, there wasn't much interference, but there was always the possibility of it, always in the back of the mind. My experience of development is, for the first sort of three or four months or a year, if you're given that long, there's a certain apprehension there. You, you're kind of doing stuff and you're kind of going, any second now, somebody's going to go, fuck off. But then you always get to a point with any development where you go, oh, this this is going to happen now. With new IPs, you're always on the back foot, I think, and you're always a bit worried. But we got it to a point within a few months where I kind of went, I think we're all right with this, guys. I think we just need to finish this. The game started with about a dozen people on the team, and by the end, people from the Banjo team were being added to work on graphics, doubling the team size. Due in part to supporting an extensive vocal track, the game would become one of the few titles on the Nintendo 64 to be produced on a 64 megabyte cartridge. We didn't need that little thing, did we? The memory card, yeah, memory, no. Yeah, yeah, so it didn't use the memory expansion. No, they didn't. Because you'd have to uh, go through testing twice. Yeah. Donkey Kong 64, they did use it, didn't they? Which yeah. means that we it did... It had to use it. Which means that we did a much better job of optimising the yeah. game. Development on Conqueror's Bad Fur Day lasted about 12 to 18 months, and the game was finally released in March 2001. <laughs> The game begins with Conker recovering from a hangover. He then wanders into different situations encountering other characters who ask for his help, where he would then do his best to assist them before moving on. Conker is portrayed as a nice, well-meaning squirrel, if not a bit crass, who often found himself surrounded by characters who were never as smart as he was, but more than willing to take advantage of him. He's an innocent. He's lovely. He's a very nice little fellow. Everyone else is an idiot. <laughs> While Conker had the right persona to offset his surroundings, his girlfriend Barry, previously seen in Conker's Pocket Tales, received an update that drastically changed her appearance into something more curvaceous. Barry, right, Barry was an interesting one, wasn't she? In the original game, it was your typical run-of-the-mill, middle-of-the-road girlfriend character. But this is more kind of a bit of a harder edge, I guess. Well, that's the joke, isn't it? It's that uh, Roger Rabbit thing of the most unlikely couple. It's actually the most yeah. appropriate couple. Essentially, so, yeah. that's what it is, isn't it? Kevin's render was better. <laughs> <laughs> How big do we need these tits? <laughs> How big can you get them? The gameplay consisted of the types of challenges inherent to Rare's other platform games like Banjo-Kazooie and Donkey Kong 64, where the player had to solve puzzles or defeat enemies, but Bad Fur Day offered its own sweeping changes to the formula. For instance, the number of items players had to collect in order to progress were reduced to just talking wads of cash. Conker's moveset was also more simplified, as players weren't forced to memorize a variety of button combinations to pull off specific actions. Instead, Conker would gain new abilities temporarily by pressing the corresponding button displayed on context-sensitive pads placed throughout the game, an idea originally thought up by Tim Stamper. Context-sensitive buttons. Right, so context-sensitive. I guess you could call it a get-out-of-jail-free device, which basically meant, we don't know what the fuck to do now. I know, put a context-sensitive button down, and we can do what we want. So that could be anything. So it's a really simple mechanic. I think lots of people use it now, don't they? While Chris Siever was the primary designer and led the project, he was never given that official title, mainly because he didn't want it. I never had an official title. I was all, I've, to the day I left, I was senior artist. So I never officially got any kind of, I got paid appropriately, which is the important thing. But um, the idea of roles and stuff, it was everyone knew what you were doing. Everyone knew who you were or who you weren't sort of thing. You didn't need a big title. It's pretty clear, yeah, he's in charge of that. Thing is, it was like the roles were kind of mud. They were just everyone did a bit of everything. There was no real specialization. So we weren't organized to be hard or otherwise. We have a rough idea for the week, what we're going to do. We're doing this task ahead of us. We might need a bit of software for this. What do you reckon? OK, I'll do a little bit of work. And it just kind of carried on. And then a year and a half later, we went, I think we've got enough now. Let us do the ending. While designing levels with their own narratives, the team would become inspired by a number of famous movies at the time. The levels involving Conker would turn out as parodies to these films, and serve as a sort of reward for completing the level. 
The parodies were more than just for the sake of movie references, as they also heavily influenced the design of their respective levels by giving ideas for musical cues or gameplay sequences. They really complemented the game, and Chris believed that if the parodies weren't there, Conker's Bad Fur Day probably would have turned out completely different and not as good. It was never originally intended to be a feature, but the development of the game was generally unscripted, with ideas constantly being bounced back and forth between the team members. A lot of the creativity and funny gags came out of spontaneity of what they were doing. This made the development cycle more fluid, and they were always excited about whatever they were going to work on next. When each level was being designed this way, the team members would always work with anticipation of seeing their random ideas come to fruition. Some of my best friends are people who I worked, worked with me on that game. Some of them are at Rare still, some of them have moved on. But yeah, I, I, I figure if we hadn't killed each other by the end of that game, <laughs> we were probably fairly good friends. Because it's very intense. You're in each other's faces every day. And I didn't have a family or anything, and, and some of the guys did. They had families to go home to, so I imagine it was a lot worse for them doing all those hours. To come through at the end and go, okay, brilliant. Let's do something else now. It's, it's probably a pretty good sign that everything was all right. One of the more memorable sequences from the game came about through Chris Marlowe, the team software engineer who happened to be a trained opera singer. Not a dull moment, life is all action, job satisfaction's what I enjoy. Lots of adventure, money and laughter, all I've been after since I was a boy. Chris Seaver wanted to design a character that was both hilarious and repulsive, so he cast Marlowe as a singing pile of feces. Uh oh. I am the great mighty poo, and I'm going to throw my shit at you. A huge supply of tish comes from my chocolate starfish. How about some scat, you little twat? Robin Beeman wrote all the lyrics. He, he was the writer, he was the composer. I mean, anything musical or otherwise, sound wise, was Robin. Which he went up after for, which I'm sure he won't mind me telling you about. Conker's Bad Fur Day was originally designed to be a lot bigger. The team started with a map that would constantly have levels added or merged with it. Chris already had an idea for the beginning and end of the game sorted out, so it just became a matter of designing levels to fit between the predetermined bookends. The thing with foreshadowing is it makes it look like you'd planned the game, but what actually happened was, once we put something in later, we went, okay, we better reference that earlier on in the game and yeah. we create a new cutscene. So it just, then you looked at professional. So we were kind of refining the beginning, the middle, and the end of the game all the way through. This allowed them to design a variety of levels and sequences they could potentially use, but by the end of development, a lot of them had to be left behind. Besides the main campaign, there was also a robust multiplayer mode for up to four players across seven different game types whose scenarios varied just as much as the ones in the main game. Conker's Bad Fur Day's dark and twisted approach to comedy was well received by critics and players who saw it as clever and fresh. From a graphical standpoint, the game was considered a technical marvel on the Nintendo 64, featuring effects uncommon on the console, like dynamic shadows, detailed facial animations with lip syncing, and large areas with long draw distances. I think we were right on the edge of what we could do with the N64 because it was the last, it was our last game on that system. We were right at the end of the N64, so it did make a big difference to, to, to the visuals. The game was also seen as an improvement over Rare's more recent platformers that many felt had become too bloated with extraneous as collectibles. It still had its share of criticisms, however, like how the game's main campaign was very linear in nature, shortening its overall length, and the few occasions where the camera would work against the player during platforming sequences that were more punishing than usual. Perhaps the biggest dilemma both the developers and critics had with the game was whether or not there was even a viable audience for it. It wasn't so much that Conker's Bad Fur Day was a game that reveled in its vulgarity, but it was on a console where a few of those games thrived, let alone existed, unless they had to for legal reasons. Chris never wanted to tone down the content in Conker's Bad Fur Day, as the very idea of diluting anything he'd worked on would go against everything he learned working at Rare. Aside from a few jokes that Nintendo wouldn't let pass, Chris managed to keep most of what he wanted in the final game. If parents can't police their children, then that's not my problem. If it clearly states on the box, don't, this isn't for kids, then what can you do? 
a new kids would be playing it. They play games. That's what they do. And and any and, it's, and any game that a kid's told you can't play this, what goes to the top of the Christmas list? So I figured that that's what would happen. But it wasn't a concern. I mean, it's not like it was blowing people's heads off or torturing people. It was, it was all good fun. Despite Conker's Bad Fur Day being the type of game hardly ever marketed on their systems, Nintendo still supported Rare and helped them publish it. However, the game's adult content resulted in advertising options that were much more restrictive and marketing budgets that were much smaller compared to Rare's prior collaborations with the Nintendo. It could only get print ads in magazines like Playboy and Maxim, and commercials for the game were limited to late night programming. Big game and toy retailers were choosing not to sell it, and to make matters worse, the game wasn't even able to see a release in countries like Spain and Japan. It was a difficult game to sell because of the mature. We couldn't advertise in certain magazines. So like the official Nintendo magazine, we couldn't. I don't even think we were reviewed. I could be wrong on that, but because it's a children-friendly game, there were certain rules that meant, nope, you can't even show this game. So it was very difficult to promote. I don't think the Japanese market really understood it. Did nothing in Japan. I don't. I don't even know if it was released. I mean, it did it, okay in America. In Europe, it did pretty well. But it was. It was released by THQ. I think it was a funny deal. I never really understood what that was about. But uh, it didn't get that much promotion. Certainly not. Not the same as something like Decongregation or Banjo, which is a bit more sort of fitted in the box. They could pull a box off the shelf and go, "This is how we market this." With Conquer, it was like, "Oh shit." Conquer's Bad Fur Day was also released at the end of the Nintendo 64's life cycle. In just a few more months. Nintendo would have already released their next console, the GameCube. Still tried to make the best game we could. Maybe the sort of the, the sort of let's say controversy around its content and its themes maybe eclipsed or shielded people away from from the fact that actually it was a decent game. And had it had that avatar been a different character, like had it been a more recognisable Nintendo character in a very similar world, doing similar things but with a different context, I think it would have sold and done a lot more because people would have looked at it for what it was, which was a good game. Conker's Bad Fur Day was widely regarded as a financial disappointment. But as time went by and more people got their hands on it, word of mouth continued to spread about just how great of a game it was. Players became captivated by its sharp writing, raunchy humor, and numerous parodies. While games like Mario and Banjo had more mass appeal, those who were knowledgeable about Conker's Bad Fur Day saw playing it as a rite of passage, and the game soon grew a cult following. As funny as the game was, many were taken aback by its surprisingly somber ending, which could be interpreted as a cliffhanger. This only made fans desire a sequel continuing the story, but events occurring behind the scenes at Rare would make that proposition much more difficult. Shortly after Conker's Bad Fur Day was released, Rare was purchased in its entirety by Microsoft in 2002. A number of projects previously in the works for Nintendo's GameCube made the slow transition to the Xbox, such as Cameo, Perfect Dark Zero, and Grabbed by the Ghoulies. As these games were being developed, Chris and the Conquer team found themselves assigned to working on a remake of a game they just finished making. I'm not even sure how that happened, to be honest. I think we just started working on it because we had nothing else to do. Chris Marlowe got the code out and went, I can get this to work on the Xbox really easy. So he did, and we went, it's alright. It was originally called Conquer Live and Uncut, and then they wanted cuts, and I said, can't really call it that now, can we? And they were quite indignant, and then they eventually agreed, oh yeah, I guess you're right. The name would be changed to Conquer Live and Reloaded, and there were changes planned that became more substantial over time, such as the general control scheme. We used the Halo type control for any weapons in Live and Reloaded, which was infinitely better. Yeah, well, I thought that was the one thing in Live and Reloaded I really liked was the way we did the, the over their shoulder yeah. sort of look. Yeah. Which, yeah. That's really a third really person thing. The game would also feature a new team-based multiplayer mode, which came about from Chris being an avid fan of multiplayer shooters on the PC at the time. Uh, yeah, it was multiplayer. It was my I was big, obsessive player of Team Fortress at the time. Massive, just completely dominated my gaming time. So I was like, I want to make. I'm going to make my own Team Fortress. I'm going to make what I'm going to make what I think Team Fortress could be on the console. And that's really what it was. It was just me being selfish. So that's what the multiplayer was in Live and Alive and Reloaded. It was my take on your straightforward character, role-driven multiplayer shoot 'em up. It was a funny one because no one was really paying much attention to us as a team. We were sort of in the corner somewhere doing our thing. So we were kind of left to our own devices and we just did this. And we did this multiplayer and for some reason Tim got to play it with everyone in all the barns. And again, it was a, it was one of those Tim moments where he goes, he plays it and you know, shit, he's either going to like it and they're alright or he's not and we're dead. 
And he really liked it, and I was very surprised. And he said, right, well, just do more of that. And it was the same thing again, and we went, all right, yeah, okay, we'll do that. And in the meantime, there was another part of the team who were getting the original Conqueror and just converting it. And the idea was just to do a straight conversion and, and just sort of upscale the graphics a bit. But what it actually ended up being was, because I wouldn't have been happy with that, we completely redid it. We got a whole art department in, redid it. The multiplayer changed considerably, it became this whole... It was like a game in itself almost, it was a big job. So it was sort of like two teams on the same team. Multiplayer doing the multiplayer game, and then there was the conversion of the original game with the new stuff that was going in. While the team put in the effort to make Conquer Live and Reloaded look like a brand new game from the ground up, it's mostly become remembered by players for being more censored compared to the N64 original, and having a multiplayer mode that wasn't as compelling either. Conquer Live and Reloaded failed to resonate with a sizable audience, perhaps in part because, like its N64 counterpart, it was released at the end of the console's life cycle as Microsoft would be releasing the Xbox 360 in just a few more months. Before working on Live and Reloaded, Chris had originally intended to design a game that would serve as a sequel to Conquer's Bad Fur Day. It was called Other Bad Day, and it was the premise was Conquer is no longer king. He spent all the money on beer, hookers, and somewhere else, probably property or fast cars. And he's been rumbled and thrown into a dungeon. And the opening scene is him in a dungeon with a ball and chain, and that was the gameplay. I've got a ball and chain, how do we do gameplay with a ball and chain? So that was going to be the first mechanic. And it just took it from there, and he was in a big tower, and the, all the gargoyles were there, and we just introduced the old characters and some new ones. And he was just going to develop from that. Conquer's now sentenced to death, he's a fugitive. And it was the same format. Lots of characters, lots of silly little situations, and in the end he would eventually become Emperor of the Known Universe, was, was the last thing. So, so going from being a reluctant king, he would end up being the reluctant Emperor of the Known Universe. And I got some of the levels worked out, but essentially that was all that was done. I knew where it would start, I knew where it would end, and I knew some of the parodies that we were going to do. It wouldn't have to be that though, you couldn't do it any other way, you'd have to be the everyman again, because that's what he was in the original. I always knew right from the start he was going to end up as king, and it was going to take place in a day. Starts off in the morning, goes through the day, ends up at night, and he's king. Right from the moment I started design I knew this is the arc, and that was really important. And it kind of defined a lot of the structure. And I did that in the second one, I did exactly the same thing. Where does it start, where does it end? Right, let's just fill in the gaps now. It was always bookended. Rather than kind of keep going and wondering, oh, what the fuck, I don't know where we're going. Midway through development, Microsoft came along and wanted them to shift it over to the Xbox 360, as the original Xbox was nearing the end of its life cycle. Not wanting to spend at least another two years working on what they had, Chris decided to transition development onto the remake instead. Even though it probably would have faced more resistance coming to fruition, Chris still regrets passing on the opportunity when he had the chance at it. Had I did it now, obviously the parodies would change because there's new movies out and these things to parody. Which is interesting because parodying, that was a problem actually now. I don't even know if we could make Conquer now because we'd get our asses sued by everyone for ripping off people's films. It's a bit of a funny legal area that is. I think Microsoft would have gone, you know what guys, we can't do this. A lot of the artwork done for the game would move over onto another game called Conquer Getting Medieval. For his next project, Chris wanted to focus on designing an online multiplayer shooter once again. Despite having Conker's name in the title, the main character was planned to be the Grim Reaper from Bad Fur Day, and this game would focus on the world of Conker rather than the Squirrel himself. Unfortunately, the project never came together, and Chris felt he couldn't face spending another three years working on a game starring Conker. There has been nothing publicly shown of this game beyond early concept art released by the designers. Conquer as a video game property has endured a precarious existence. A game with a development history as troubled as Bad Fur Days still seems unlikely to ever happen again. It was faced with the risk of cancellation, but the management at Rare believed in its team enough to let Chris Seaver design the game how he wanted. At the same time, Nintendo was there willing to support Rare's decision, no doubt thanks to their previous years of success together. Conquer's Bad Fur Day failed to live up to the company's past success because it was sold on its shock value but the final product was of such high quality that it's since become regarded as one of Rare's essential gameplay experiences. There have been many games with crude humor as their selling point, but the fact that Bad Fur Day became a commercial product from companies like Rare and Nintendo still feels inconceivable. It's been celebrated and defended by fans who grew up with the game, but to those who want to see Conquer on more adventures, the chances become more unlikely with each passing day.
Conker may have thrived through word of mouth, but he was never a breakout success for Rare, Nintendo, or Microsoft. Conker has made appearances in other games since Live and Reloaded, though the efforts from other developers have only come off as paltry experimentations instead of the worthy successor fans would have wanted. For some, the only proper continuation of Conker's adventures would have to come from Chris Seaver, but while Chris has offered to provide his signature voice on these other projects, he believes he couldn't pull off a faithful sequel either. He believes no company would give him the budget needed because it never had the audience large enough to make it worthwhile. At the same time, if a game like Conker's Bad Fur Day was made now with the same team, Chris feels it probably wouldn't be the game people want because the team who made it have changed and so have their tastes. Chris still finds Bad Fur Day to be funny, though he'd probably change some things about it now. It's an unfortunate reality many fans of Conker have come to terms with. As time goes by, Conker's final words to the players at the end of Bad Fur Day have become all the more appropriate while ever more bittersweet. So, there I am, king, king of all the land, and who'd have thought that? <laughs> but you know, I don't really think I want it. I just want to go home with Barry, and, hmm, it's not gonna happen. It's true what they say, the grass is always greener, and you don't really know what it is you have until it's gone. 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 We didn't necessarily have all the best people in the industry, by any stretch of the imagination, in any one discipline, but we had the right mix of people. I think it was like it was like a, it was the stars were aligned on this game. All the kind of creativity that went into it, everything just sort of worked, didn't it? The tone of it, and, and the, the feel of the, the quests and the storylines and all the little stupid things that were going. It all really came together. Next time, in part 10 of this Rare retrospective, Rare begins development on another ambitious title that would become the company's swan song on a Nintendo console, but the result remains one of the most controversial collaborations in Nintendo's history. 